Uh, my name is Himangi and I'm from the marketing team at ShareSite. It's great to have you all here today. Um, I'm here in North Sydney with Wins, uh, the CEO and founder of Life Sherpa in their swanky studio. Thanks for having me, Wins. Well, it's great to have you at Sherpa HQ. And uh, it's always good to talk all things stocks and ETFs with uh, the ShareSite team. The, exactly. Uh, Best provider of portfolio management software in Australia. So we're big fans of ShareSite. Our members get uh, the ShareSite portfolio, and uh, our paid members, that is, and um, we, uh, we use it quite regularly. And I am excited to kick off the second session in the Investing Masterclass, which is run by Wynne Scully. So today's hot topic is growth investing with ETFs. Uh, before we begin, however, let's do some hygiene things, get them out of the way. Uh, for all our new attendees who didn't know about ShareSide, uh, we're an online portfolio tracker, like Wins mentioned. We aim to empower investors by simplifying complex investment data, uh, by helping investors make informed decisions and become savvy investors. With over 400,000 users globally, our goal is to bring institutional level insights uh, to all investors from beginners to experienced investors or even intermediaries such as financial planners and accountants and for those who are meeting wins for the first time uh, wins is a veteran financial advisor with over 35 years of experience in this industry he was named one of the most one of the 50 most influential advisors by the financial standard and he's not only the author of two books he's also the founder of life sherpa which is australia's most affordable financial advice service uh, life sherpa has even received the finney's award for excellence in the wealth management by fintech australia and without further ado let's get started uh wins over to you well thanks Amangi. that's uh great introduction. I could have, couldn't have written it better myself. Um, so for those of you who were here last time, and indeed for those of you who weren't here, uh, we covered off what I call the five B's of investment, which are the five asset classes. And today we're going to look at how we can implement the growth categories in uh, ETFs traded on the Australian Stock Exchange. So I'm going to start by doing just a quick recap on where we got to last time. And asset allocation is the number one driver of returns. And um, the, that's a fancy way of saying how you divvy up your investment between the five asset classes is far more important than whether you buy Vanguard or BlackRock uh, or BHP or NAB. Um, and so you should be spending most of your time getting this right. And um, Hamangi will show you a new tool in ShareSite that will help clarify what you're actually invested in. So just recapping where we were, uh, we introduced the five Bs of investing. So we've got three defensive um, asset classes, uh, and that's bills, which is broadly cash and short-term bank bills, uh, bonds, which are longer term, medium and longer term loans, largely to governments and corporates, uh, bullion, which is sort of shorthand for commodities. But for most retail investors, that means gold. Uh, and then on the growth side, we have bricks and businesses. So bricks is infrastructure and real estate and businesses is equities. So many people starting investing will start at the equity side of things. And equities are certainly the powerhouse of growth in most portfolios. And as I said, how you divvy your money up among these five classes is the number one driver of returns. Uh, potentially 90% of your returns are driven by that allocation. So for, you know, if you're used to looking at uh, pre-mixed portfolios in your super fund or in uh, even multi-asset uh, ETFs, You'll, be, you'll have heard terms like 90-10, 70-30, and that describes the per percentage of the funds that's invested in growth versus defensive. So VDHG, Vanguard High Growth, Diversified High Growth ETF, 
is a 90-10. It's 90% growth, which is pretty well businesses because it's equities, and 10% defensive, in that case, bonds. Um, so when we stick to the growth assets, we're talking about bricks and businesses. So today, we're going to start with the, I guess, the core of most people's portfolios, and that's Australian large cap equities. That is usually the largest 200 or 300 companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. And they're all those big names that you know day to day. You know, the banks, NAB, Westpac, CBA, um, and ANZ, of course. Uh, the two big miners, BHP and Rio. Two supermarkets, Coles and, and Woolworths. And um, companies that we're used to dealing with day to day. So the four biggest ETFs that invest in Australian large caps, uh, we have A200 from BetaShares, IOZ from uh, iShares, uh, and, there, and, and STW from um, <clears throat> State Street. And those three invest in the ASX 200, uh, well, the top 200. Um, the beta shares one is not the S&P ASX 200. It's a an unlicensed variation, um, which is slightly more biased towards the large end of the 200. And then, of course, the largest ETF on the Australian market, uh, Vanguard Australian Shares Index, or VAS, um, and it invests in the S&P 300. That's the 300 largest shares. Um, when we look at these, um, so there are slight differences in uh, fees. Fees have been trending downwards over the last few years. So you know, the difference between the cheapest being A200 at four basis points, that's 0.04%, or the most expensive being Vanguard at seven basis points. That difference is largely immaterial and um, won't really show up materially in your in your results. Uh, here's a graph of what it looks like um, back to 2018. And the reason for the 2018 cutoff is A200 is the youngest of these and it launched in 2018. So you will see that um, over time, there's not a lot of difference over that five year period. So the index itself, um, which obviously has no no transaction costs, no brokerage, and is reinvested instantly. That returned 56% over the, or 56.12% in total return over that period. Um, STW was the worst performer at 54.9%. So, you know, one, 1.2% 1 difference over five years. Um, it used to be more high cost, so its cost came down later. And um, the best performer, which moderately outperformed the index, was the beta shares A200. And that's largely a function of its slight overweight in the top 10. Um, I don't believe that any of these are particularly material. The fee difference is largely immaterial. Um, but that's not to say that these funds all behave identically. Um, this chart is an interesting one. So this looks at the monthly returns over those 68 months where they were all available. Um, overall, they track each other reasonably closely um, and all delivered 23 negative months in the last 68, which is, you know, pretty typical. Um, that's almost one in four or just over one in four. And that's what you would expect from large cap Australian shares. Um, but I think the interesting thing to take from this chart, though, is there are 12 months in which the spread between the worst performing and the best performing of the four exceeded a half of 1%. So if you're looking at trading these things, um, 
you need to pay a bit more attention to what you're doing. And that's partly why we prefer VAS because it is the largest and most liquid of all the, all the four funds. It's not the oldest, STW is the oldest. Um, and I wouldn't be paying too much attention to the A200 outperformance, um, that sort of statistical noise. But there were, you know, almost every month, so 55 out of the 68 months, the spread between the worst performing and the highest performing exceeded 0.1%, which when you expect an annual return of, well, the ASX has delivered 13% average return over 122 years. So 0.1% a month is material. It does wash out over time. Um, but you know, when you had market allocations here, so here's the... March 2020, um, you know, we had a very, that's the COVID drop, um, you know, those sort of market dislocations do create material differences in returns. Now that's largely around the balance date. So it's really only an issue for traders. So when we look at those um, ETFs and look at how do we choose which of the four, um, so VAS tracks the 300, which gives you marginal diversification benefits. The top 200 is 97.6% of the 300. So the extra two and a bit percent won't change your returns all that materially. Uh, if you're looking for small cap investments in Australia, you've really got to look outside the 300 and um, probably look at active managers. And there aren't really ETFs that well, there's no index to track for a start, so there aren't very many ETFs. Um, STW and IOZ both track the ASX 200, and the and A200 tracks uh, a more obscure index called the Selective 200, which is slightly overweight, the top tw 10 and top 20. I'm not convinced that these are particularly material, and the differences over time, I suspect, will wash out. Um, A200 is the newest, and... Uh, VAS is the largest. It's $27 billion, um, which is a significant but not dominating share of the total value of the market, which is you know, a trillion and a half or thereabouts. In terms of performance, IOZ marginally outperformed VAS, um, but 34 basis points over 14 years is, in my mind, statistical noise. That's not 34 basis points a year. It's a total of 34 basis points. So about you know, less than three basis points a year. And a fair bit of that I think can be allocated to or attributed to the higher fees going back. Um, and I think that's probably certainly true in the case of STW. Um, A200 short-term out of performance looks impressive. Yeah, it's 20 basis points a year, but I think that's Statistical noise and time will tell. So of those, we prefer VAS, Vanguard, um, largely on the grounds of size, liquidity, and history. Um, if there's any questions, spring to mind, just drop it in the chat. Um, moving on now to global large cap. And um, it's worth just looking at... Um, how markets get classified before we before we get into this topic. So there are two key index providers. There's MSCI, which is Morgan Stanley Capital Investors, and they obviously produce the MISCI or MSCI index. And Markets get classified between developed markets, which are ones where you can be confident of the rule of law. They've got well-regulated well markets, accounting standards are, are good, and uh, market surveillance is good. So you can rely on those. There's about 23 of those. And they're all the big markets you would be familiar with. So most of Western Europe, North America, uh, Canada and US in North America, Australia, New Zealand in this part of the world, uh, Japan, Singapore, uh, in the, and Hong Kong in Asia. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, then there's a bunch of emerging markets, which are 
markets that are not quite as developed. Um, and there are some of those in Eastern, Eastern Europe, so Poland, Czech Republic, Greece, Hungary, Turkey, um, and more of the South American and uh, Asian countries. So they're getting there. Some of those are fairly large markets in the scheme of things, um, but you know, less well regulated, um, less efficient, um, and so there are some opportunities there. But the advantage of them is that they tend to grow faster, and GDP growth is a big generator of equity returns. Um, but the point of putting this slide up is there are some subtle differences between um, how MSCI and FTSE, or Financial Times uh, London Stock Exchange, um, classify countries. So, um, for example, um, South Korea is treated as a developed market by FTSE, or FTSE, and it's an emerging market for um, MSCI purposes. So if you're mixing funds that track MSCI indexes and FTSE indexes, you do have to be careful you don't either go overweight some companies or underweight some companies. So if you linked um, a MSCI developed fund with a FTSE emerging market, you're going to miss out on South Korea. And South Korea is a particularly important uh, growth economy. And you may double up on some of the uh, Eastern European countries. So take that with, with care and look at what's in these indexes. So moving on to the available funds here, um, you'll recognize many of these names if you've played around in the market at all. Um, IVV is a iShares fund which tracks the S&P 500, the 500 largest um, companies in the USA. And the US is about 60% of the global market. So very important part of any portfolio. Um, the other main exposure to the US market is uh, VTS, which is a Vanguard total market index. A total market meaning includes not only the large companies like the S&P 500, but also mid cap and small cap. Um, now the Australian investment in this is, um, it's actually a depository receipt. So what you're buying is a piece of paper that's backed by a unit in the US fund, VTI, which is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, it's also one of, it, and that invests in a, in a US-based Vanguard fund called VTS. And um, that's one of the 12 funds that owns Vanguard. So structurally, this is a very different beast. Um, the, total, the CRSP total market index is less liquid than the S&P 500. So that's an issue for traders who want to exchange, you know, to try and help keep the NTA and market price together by exchanging the underlying basket of shares for units and vice versa, because the cost of hedging goes up slightly. Um, so the plus is you get exposure to mid cap and small cap. The downside is hedging is more complicated, therefore spread should be wider and you've got these structural problems. Um, the structural problems are the deal breaker for me, and we're not a fan of VTS at Life Sherpa. Um, then moving uh, out of the US, uh, we have uh, VEU, which is the Vanguard All World X US, and that tracks the FTSE All World X US. Um, all world in that context means all developed world. It's a bit confusing. So it's the 22 countries that go, to, uh, 23 countries that go to make up the FTSE all world, excluding the US. Uh, VGE is Vanguard's Emerging Markets ETF, and it tracks the FTSE Emerging Markets, including China A. 
and uh, that's uh, an important qualification, that second bit, because it does give you a significant exposure to China. And um, yeah, it's the 60 pound gorilla in this part of the world, but it's um, you know got a whole bunch of regulatory and rule of law problems. Um, IOO uh, is a global top 100. It tracks the S&P Global 100. So that's the 100 largest companies around the world uh, in the developed world. Um, BGBL, Beta Shares Global Shares ETF, tracks a, again, one, an obscure um, developed market, X Australia, large and mid-cap uh, index. It's relatively new. Um, IVE is, um, again, it's an iShares product and it tracks um, the MISCI EAFE, so Europe, Asia, and Far East is what that stands for, which is really the developed world, according to MISCI, less the USA and Canada. Uh, and then finally, VGS, which is a MSCI world X Australia. So that includes, um, that's again a developed world. So um, lots of choice there. Um, I've deliberately excluded, there are a bunch of um, hedged, currency hedged products. Um, I've deliberately not included those on this list here because we believe that overseas equities should not be hedged. And that's because part of the reason for going global is diversification. And diversification comes from markets, it comes from currencies, it comes from regulation, it comes from industry focus. So you don't want to hedge away your currency diversification. Now, that's not the case with bonds where you, what you're looking for in going global is diversification in issuer and you don't want that currency risk. So we generally take the position that um, equity should be unhedged. For an Australian investor, um, that actually creates a, a interesting um, self-hedge almost because um, the Australian dollar is a commodity-based currency. So when economies are booming, commodities generally go up in price, which drives the Australian dollar up, which obviously when the Australian dollar goes up and you're invested offshore, the value of your overseas assets falls relatively. Whereas when the opposite happens, markets decline, demand for commodities decline, Australian dollar declines, and investors look for the security of the US dollar, which then gives you a boost to your overseas shares um, in Australian dollar terms. So for all of those reasons, we believe um, equities should not be hedged. Um, for those of you who've invested in uh, the Vanguard diversified multi-asset ETFs like VDHG, um, they do include a hedged portion um, and um, they raise some interesting arguments in their white paper, um, but we believe that the costs um, of doing so and the uh, loss of diversification and the loss of the natural hedge of currency movements is not suited to Australian investors. Um, a US investor um, could very well benefit from some hedging, um, but we're based in Australia. So as an Australian dollar investor who will be spending their money in Australian dollars, uh, you don't want to be hedged. Um, so when it comes to um, our preferred ETFs, um, again, emphasizing the adopt and unhedge position, um, we like IVV VEU as the global pair and uh, adjust downwards our Australian holding of VAS um, to reflect the fact 
that VU's got about 4% Australia in it. Um, this is low cost and it gives you the flexibility to adjust the US position um, from time to time. Um, the US has over time become a greater and greater part of the world and um, sometimes you need to trim that position and IVVVU gives you the ability to do that. Um, we deliberately eliminated VTS um, for a number of reasons, um, primarily around the Vanguard ownership issue. And this is, this is important that, um, and for some reason, it's not disclosed in the Australian prospectus. The Australian prospect, per, prospectus does reference the US prospectus where this is disclosed. And VTS, which anyone who's read JL Collins will be familiar with VTS AX, which is the Admiral shares in the unlisted fund, uh, is one of the 12 funds that owns Vanguard, that company, which means that some of the money you invest in VTI or VTS is invested in Vanguard. It's also party to a agreement called the Fifth Restated and Amended Funds Distribution Agreement, uh, which you can Google and download off from the SEC, but the ASX decided you didn't need to know about it. Um, and that provides um, a requirement for these 12 funds to invest in the company and to indemnify the company for certain expenses with a cap. And um, whilst this is a small risk, um, the major risk being IT project overruns, um, litigation that's not covered by uh, insurance and um, yeah, marketing that just doesn't work. Um, it's a risk that you should only take if you're being rewarded for it. And five, 10, 20 years ago, um, Vanguard was by far the cheapest game in town. And in those cases, it made sense. But now that it's you know, within a basis point or two of the competitors, we don't think that's a risk that retail investors should take. And then you add in on top of that, the complexity of the CDI structure and the uh, extra cost to hedge the crisp index, which should see spreads wider than um, other funds. And VGS, VGE is the other combination that people would uh, often use. And we think that the mismatch between the MISCI and FTSE definitions of emerging developed markets um, make that a unsatisfactory replication of global markets. So our preference here is IVV, VEU, um, and that's a relatively low cost way of doing it. So I'm sure there should be triggering lots of questions in the uh, in the chat, which we will come back to. So keep throwing your questions in. Uh, the next B is BRICS, and we'll start with infrastructure. And um, infrastructure is an interesting one. So for those of you not uh, who haven't been following this, infrastructure is all of those things that a modern society needs to to th live and thrive, um, you can sort of break it down into telecommunications, transport, and energy. So telecommunications, you know, telephone, data, transmission lines and towers, um, and satellites. Transportation, all the usual, you know, roads, railways, bridges, tunnels, ports, airports, um, uh, canals even. Um, and on the energy side, electricity generation, distribution and transmission, pipelines and water supply. Now, all of, all of those um, industries are highly regulated. In many places, the government sets the price and the demand for many of these products is relatively stable. And um, for that reason, um, some people treat these like bonds, um, that they do have some defensive characteristics, but I think the better way to characterize them is as low beta equity. So they're equities because these are businesses um, and they tend to move around 
less than the market as a whole. So where the market moves 1%, you might expect a member of the infrastructure index to move by 0.6 or 0.7. And that reduced volatility helps to dampen volatility in your overall portfolio uh, without giving up return like you'd have to with bonds to get the same, same effect. Uh, they also tend to be have inflation-linked uh, revenue streams. So they tend to perform very well in uh, inflation environments. Um, the last two years being a key exception to that. And um, they also tend to um, benefit from low interest rates, which does two things. One, it reduces their cost of debt and they're generally highly leveraged. And two, the valuations tend to be based on uh, risk-free premiums. So a rise in interest rates will generally see the value of an infrastructure product fall. So we see these as, uh, you know, if you go back to your uh, five factors of investing, if you've read the Pharma French um, factor model, you'll see that, uh, you know, the market premium was the, was the first of the five factors that was discovered. Um, and uh, so mixing in some low beta um, stocks can, can deliver good um, dampening of volatility without giving up returns. So infrastructure is an important part of any portfolio. Um, and when we look at how do we buy this, there are four major funds on the market here. Um, we've got the iShares uh, core FTSE infrastructure here, uh, GLIN. Uh, it uh, tracks the FTSE developed core infrastructure 50-50 um, and it's hedged. So the 50-50 refers to capping within sectors. So rather than looking at the whole of the core infrastructure sector, the 50-50 index caps the telecommunications, transport and energy. So you get, um, you're not reflecting the market as a whole. Um, we don't like this capping, so we would prefer a straight core infrastructure. Um, we do like core infrastructure. Um, so that would include a lot of, um, you know, uh, developers. So people who develop wind farms, for example, rather than own and manage them. It would include, the non-core stuff would also include engineering contractors, designers, and they're much closer to traditional businesses and a much higher beta. So we look at the core infrastructure when we're looking for an index here. Um, Vanek, uh, IFRA is uh, tracks the FTSE, again, developed core infrastructure 50-50, and uh, both of those are hedged. It is often hard to find an unhedged infrastructure product, um, and that's because, um, and I'm going to put my hands up as being guilty for spreading this rumor, uh, I was involved with the Macquarie infrastructure team in the very early days, and when we were trying to sell infrastructure to fund managers, we were trying to convince them that this was bond-like and um, could be a substitute for bo bonds in the portfolio and could be a substitute for real estate. And as a result, many people developed, uh, say, well, if it's a bond, I should hedge it. And so many infrastructure funds are hedged and we would rather see these things as low beta equities rather than bonds. So we would recommend they be not unhedged. The unhedged option here is VBLD, the Vanguard Global Infrastructure Index. And not only is it not hedged, um, it tracks the developed core infrastructure without the 50-50 overlay. So that's definitely our preferred option here. Um, despite the fact that it's got a slightly higher uh, ICR, so it's twice, more than twice the price of IFRA, um, and it's three times the price of uh, the iShares product. Uh, it's unhedged and it's core, so it's our preferred. Um, Magellan have um, an actively managed fund, which is, uh, they do have an active hedge. Uh, it's mostly hedged. Um, 
but they they do have the ability to actively manage the hedge, much like the Platinum Global Fund. Um, they've made that's a fairly concentrated portfolio, and they've made some very poor calls in um, U.S. electricity utilities. So we don't like this product, um, despite the fact that the manager's got a really good um, pedigree, <coughs> and. Uh, I know them from my infrastructure background, but they've made some very poor calls and it's a bit too concentrated for our likes. So VBLD is our pick here. Um, and so that's because we want to adopt an unhedged position. We want to be focused on core infrastructure. We don't like artificial sector capping. capping. We want to focus on developed markets and that means VBLD is our pick here despite its higher ICR. Um, which then brings us on to the second BRICS, which is uh, real estate. And um, real estate in this context, we look at core rental real estate in this context. We try to avoid the developers and the, um, what our American friends call REOX. Um, so the US divides real estate funds into REITs, which are close to um, listed property funds in an Australian context. They're generally buy and hold funds. They're generally buying assets for rental income and long-term capital growth. And that's in contrast to a REOC, which um, is generally more involved in uh, development, refurbishment, flipping. Um, you do get a little bit of exposure to REOX and diversified funds within the core real estate index, but relatively sl small. So the big players here are um, the Vanek Vectors REIT, REIT. Um, they got the best ticker, but not necessarily the best funds. Um, the NARIT developed rental index is a, is, would probably be our preferred index, but unfortunately this is a hedged option. It's very cheap, um, and uh, but for the hedging, this could be our, our pick. Um, DJRE, the State Street of Spider, uh, tracks the Dow Jones Global Select Real Estate Index. Um, the ESG overlay on this is relatively new. They um, so it's a core rental index primarily. They applied an ESG overlay in. Um, 2021. Um, the jury's out a bit on that. I'm not sure it's got a material impact on either the underlying assets or the expected returns. Um, it does have a relatively high ICR, um, but it's probably our pick here. Um, iShares, um, again, tracking a NARIT uh, index. Um, unfortunately, it's hedged again. Um, and we've got an actively managed one here, RCAP. Um, again, you'd expect these guys, these are probably one of the best active uh, real estate managers in the world. Um, this particular fund hasn't really performed all that well. It's got a relatively high um, ICR and it is mostly hedged. So again, um, we take the, the one unhedged option there, we like DJRE, it's unhedged, it's focused on the core with limited um, exposure to specialists and developers, and um, it doesn't have any uh, odd capping rules. So DJRE is our pick there. Um, so that's um, a quick run through of how we select um, our, our um, the ETFs that we include in our portfolios. Um, and, you know, the best ETFs individually don't necessarily make the best portfolios. It's like a good footy team that a team of champions doesn't always make a champion team. And it's how you put these together that really matters when it comes to building a portfolio. And the relative mix is what generates returns at low volati lower volatility. So before we move on to questions, um, 
I think uh, it would be time for Hamengi to show us um, the new feature in ShareSite, which helps you look through your holdings to the underlying assets and asset allocation. So over to you, Hamengi. Thanks, Vince. Well, I mean, ETFs are now becoming a popular investment type. So, I mean, thanks to... We, we love ETFs. Yeah. <laughs> ETFs are us. They're, they're so popular now. And just so that it can you can manage your ETFs and understand your ETFs a bit more. Uh, we have a handy tool that might um, help you make informed decisions about your investing. Uh, it is called as the ETF Exposure Report. So uh, other than just tracking your portfolio online, ShareSite also offers you a very comprehensive reporting tool, uh, which not only includes uh, reports during tax time, but it also helps you look into your portfolio through a diversity report, a consolidated report, and well, uh, to get started, an ETF exposure report. Uh, before I uh, give you a demo of that, I would like to just state that we don't have an AFSL, so please don't consider this as financial advice. Uh, we do. I do financial advice. Yes, not, <laughs> not as a chair side. Uh, so this in front of you is a sample portfolio, not a real one. Uh, you can see that I have three or uh, three of the holdings in ETFs and I have a bunch of individual holdings as well. Now let's check out the exposure report. So for existing share site users, all you have to do is just hop onto the report section. This is currently only available for the investor and expert and share site professional plan. Um, there you go. These are all of our reports that give you a good insight into your portfolio. Let's run the exposure report, see what it's like. We also have a little tutorial there where you can have a detailed look later. There you go. So by default, this goes on a do not group um, setting. Now this report will show you your top 50 holdings uh, by weight in each of your ETFs. And the remaining ones will be down down the uh, down below in your residual ETFs. Bear with me a moment. There are your residual ones. Now, when I'm in the do not group default category, it really just gives me a very clear view of my direct stocks that I hold against any ETFs that I might have. So as you can see, I've got a direct holding in Apple. Uh, but I also have underlying holdings in Apple through two ETFs. So at this point in time, depending on any individual investor's um, investment journey, they're, they're free to uh, use this tool to help them decide if they want to buy, hold, or sell a particular holding. Uh, as you can see, this is a do not group. Now, if I want to get a bit more insight, I can also group this by sector market currency now let's let's go by sector let's try that and there you go let's run that report there you go i have a very clear idea that my portfolio is skewed towards technology uh some residual ones and then some in retail um none in infrastructure like <laughs> we went through before uh, but I also find, uh, find it very useful to see it by country. Uh, I like to, this particular portfolio, which is not my personal portfolio, it's just a sample one. It has a good mix of holdings in every country. So as you can see, United States, Australia, UK, India, and then all the rest of my So if you compare ones. that to the MSCI world, for example, yep. you'd be slightly underweight US. Yep. You'd be well overweight Australia, which is probably appropriate for an Australian investor. Exactly. Uh, you're way overweight India mm -hmm. and well underweight United Kingdom. So it's a really good snapshot of how do I compare with the MSCI and are these differences deliberate or is it a consequence of, um, you know, unintended consequences of other decisions? So I, I like these sort of reports that really nail 
where I am relative to the indexes I'm, I'm tracking. Now, there are good reasons why you might want to diverse from the index, but it's important that they're done intentionally. So provided it just gives you a good snapshot, literally, of what your current portfolio is, and it gives you a lot of confidence to then make informed decisions about what you should be doing in your personal investment journey, obviously. And when, I mean, ETFs are now becoming very popular, a lot of times uh, people also wonder that when I add these ETFs into my portfolio, what does it do for tax What during tax time? Does that cause any implications? Well, just to help you out with that as well, we also have a different tax time reporting tool within the reports tab. For example, just just simple tax and compliance tool to help you run those reports. So along with the exposure with the tax time compliance, you get a good snapshot of your holdings, um, your ETFs, your direct holdings versus your uh, ETFs. And that really does, I mean, hopefully, hopefully it helps you, you know, make, again, informed decisions as an yeah. investor. The other report that we use a lot with our members at LifeShipper is the Unrealized Capital Gains Report. Right. Which, again, is a paid feature. Yes, it and, is. Um, it is. So that's one that, you know, if you were trying to make a decision, you know, do I replace um, my, you know, I'm going to move from VGS, VGE to IVV, VEU, what's going to be the tax consequence of doing that? Um, the f if you've got less than 10 funds, the free one will tell you what's happened after you've made the transaction. Yeah. But the unrealized capital gains report will allow you to make that decision um, a lot more um, intent intently. So one of the ones we use a lot um, and looking forward to having the exposures. Is that exposure one live now? Yes, it is live. Oh, okay. It is now live. And um, everyone, again, who's on an investor, expert, or a share side professional plan can hop onto it and look at their entire portfolio, compare their holdings with their ETFs. Um, it is now live, so it would be nice. Uh, it's a nice little feature to add on to the growing popularity of ETFs. Cool. Uh, well, to be honest, you've got a lot of nice questions coming in. Do you want to like... So you're going to read the questions out now? Yeah. Um, so I'm sure that was going to raise a lot of questions. We covered a lot of ground. Um, the question, these are being recorded. Um, you will get a copy, a link to the recording tomorrow. Um, the recording for the last webinar is on the ShareSide. Yep, it's on our YouTube, it's on um, the ShareSide YouTube um, channel. Paolo, have you put the link in the chat somewhere? Um, and so let's, let's get into the questions. Let's go. Um, and particularly this one caught my eye. Which one? Do you want to read it out? Would it not make sense to buy a hedged IVV if the AUD is weak versus USD under the assumption that if the AUD gets stronger in the future, one's investment would be relatively weaker? Uh, that's a true statement that obviously if you buy IVV and the A dollar gets stronger, the value of your investment goes down. Um, and if you if you are trying to make a currency play, um, buying equities is not a particularly direct way of doing it. So if you're trying to take a view on the currency, you should either buy or sell the currency or buy or sell bonds. Um, buying a portfolio of equities to take a currency position is um, quite inefficient. Um, if your argument is that I want to buy equities, but I think the market's going to, the Australian dollar is going to rise, um, that's a variation on market timing, which is particularly difficult to do with. Um, currencies. Um, the long-term Aussie dollar US is remarkably stable. It moves up and down. Um, and uh, so our view is um, if you want to take a currency position, take a currency position. If you want to take an equity position, take an equity position. And if you want to trade 
currencies, I'd be trading bonds. And we look at this when we look at the defensive Bs in the next episode of the next installment of the series. Um, A, we don't do market timing. Um, it's remarkably difficult to do right. Um, and B, there are much better ways of taking currency positions than buying equities. So no, I, whilst the statement you make is true, uh, you translating that into a portfolio construction decision is not as straight as straightforward as you might suggest. So I would be buying my, if I, I'd be taking my currency position in the bond market. Awesome. Um, let's look at this one. What is your take on owning IVV and BGS? Um, the reason you might want to buy, buy both of those is if you wanted to take a global position with an overweight US position. So, um, which is partly why we, we take the IVV VEU structure, um, because um, VEU doesn't have a US position. So it's much easier to see through to your exposure. Uh, with an IVV VGS combination, you, in order to work out your US position, you need to work out how, well, how much of my VGS is in the US and how much of my IVV, and obviously 100% of your IVV is in the US uh, and Canada. Um, so yes, you can do it. Um, we just don't think it's as clean as neat. Um, but if you're good at spreadsheets or you've got the share site exposure report, um, yep, um, well, you could go either way. Yeah. But our, our, our view is that IVVVU is cleaner and neater. Um, but yep, you could go that way. Would you consider PPOR a sufficient real estate holding in a portfolio? That's a great question. Um, a lot of people ask this question as, does my home count as a, a real estate investment? And the short answer to that question is no. And the reason I say that is that ownership of your PPOR is more a hedge against future rent than an investment in its own right. It's potentially a store of value, um, but it's really consumption that happens to have a residual value at the end of it. So you can consume 30 years of accommodation services from this piece of real estate, and it still has some residual value. Um, but I, you shouldn't be treating it as a real estate investment. The next step is, well, what about an investment property, a residential investment property? Is that real estate? And yes, it is, but it will behave very differently to a commercial industrial retail uh, property investment. So they're good complements. So, um, you know, a REIT investment is not a substitute for residential property investment. And so both have a very important part to play in a balanced portfolio. Um, and, um, you know, most people should have a little bit of both. So I always get very frustrated with the property or shares argument. Um, the argument is really how much of each and when rather than one or the other. They're both important parts of a balanced portfolio. Um, and, um, but your home is not, is not an investment. So it's an important part of your net worth. It's an important hedge against future growth, uh, against future rental prices, but it's not an investment. It may give you a return, but it's not an investment. It's consumption. Yeah. Um, we have time for one last question. Let's go with the, uh, what percentage of each of those ETFs should you hold? Now, um, that's, that's, I guess, the $64,000 question. Um, and that's the ultimate it depends. So as your risk profile changes, your percentage allocations will change. And um, the percentage allocations will change over time. So uh, probably in the th fourth episode of this, when we come on and look at portfolio construction, we'll, we'll address those questions in more detail. 
but the answer is that portfolio construction is about constructing a collection of assets which complement each other, represent each of the five Bs, and deliver the return that you need or seek um, at a, va a volatility that you're prepared to, to tolerate. And you really have to look at those two parameters in, in one. And we'll see, I can give you a worked example of how you can generate a, a return very similar to 100% equities portfolio from an 80-20 portfolio with the right mix of these assets. And volatility is a critical part of achieving the returns. Um, I've lost track of the arguments I've had on Reddit with software bros who say, well, you can't eat risk-adjusted returns, and that's true, but um, you can only eat the returns that you actually achieve. So tune in for uh, episode four, I think, when we're going to look at um, putting these all together. And the short answer to the question is, it depends. <laughs> um, so what else have we got here? Um, got this one. Yeah, a uh, question around, uh, we probably have time for just one more. A uh, question around uh, US estate taxes um, and US domiciled funds. Um, this is a tricky one. And certainly if you are holding large quantities of US assets, um, you do need to be careful. Um, the tax treaty um, it does help. This is a very complicated exercise. So my general view is if you're not American, you should um, in general avoid the US assets um, unless there's a very good reason to hold them. If you're investing 50,000, this is a non-issue. If you're investing yeah, a million or more, um, this is a very live issue. So um, for most Australians without a US connection, um, the, less, uh, the less, less of your assets that pass through the US, the better. It introduces a number of tax inefficiencies um, that could be solved by um, Australian or other domiciles like Luxembourg, Ireland, the Caymans. Um, but sometimes there are no choices. Um, and um, But it's really only a problem if you have a large investments. So another good reason to take professional advice and not rely on Google. 100%. I think we've... We're running out of time. We well, time. good job. There's three more episodes to come. I know. Uh, this is not the only uh, episode left in the investing masterclass. We plan to come back with uh, with wins back and uh, stay tuned. Uh, you will be receiving an email shortly with the session link in case you missed it along with the previous session, which is available on ShareSide's YouTube channel. Uh, today's session will also be up on ShareSide's YouTube channel very, very soon. And uh, thank you for joining uh, us today. It was lovely to have you. And we are so looking forward to meet you at the next edition, the third edition of the Investing Masterclass with Wynne Scully. And just to be clear, everything here was general advice only. I don't know any of your personal details, although I do recognize some names in the chat. Um, and uh, But it is general advice. We do have a financial services license, so we can provide financial advice. But all of this advice is, is of course, general advice and hasn't taken into account your personal circumstances, goals or objectives. Uh, we're more than happy to give you personal advice. Um, membership uh, is available at the site lifesherpa.com.au, which includes a um, ShareSite uh, Pro account. Yes, uh, ShareSite uh, Investor account. Investor account. So thank you for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Same bad time, same bad channel. Yes.
See you next time. Thank you. Good night.